Dr. Paul Lee, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming up here. Um, we got a lot to talk about, and um, how you doing today? Good. Beautiful day. Almost as nice as yesterday. Almost as nice as yesterday. It was a little warmer yesterday. It's just gorgeous out. So, Dr. Paul Lee, you uh, came into the station to talk with me, but we had some other alternative, uh, ulterior motives. You are giving a class here at uh, Cowell in the spring, right? Yes. And the class is called... Uh, Cowell 99. Cowell 99. And it's under the auspices of Faye Crosby, the provost of Cowell. So it may be a little difficult to find. I'm not sure it's listed in the uh, catalog, but it's Cowell 99. And I'm coming back after almost 50 years when I taught the course in 1966 when I first came here. And did you call it then nobler in the mind? No, I picked that up from Hamlet. It's just a nice term, nobler in the mind. But the class was Introduction to the Humanities. Yeah, and it covers the course from Homer to Plato. And uh, the main theme is the rise of rational consciousness. Rational self-consciousness, that's my theme. That's your theme. Now, how do, we, how do we become rational as a culture? Well, it happened with the Greeks. And also how we became self-conscious and um, achieved a centered self. That's a Greek achievement. And they bequeathed it to us. And we have been, uh, how would you say, uh, we've been... Left brain ever since. Left brain ever yeah, since. Really. We've been humbled and been holding on to this um, uh, paradigm, would you call it? Yeah, male paradigm. Male paradigm. Uh, um, so it's an interesting thing, uh, Dr. Paul Lee, uh, having had the privilege of being able to speak with you and talk with you over the last couple months, um, you both uh, understand some of the outfall, you could call it, from the Greek paradigm and this rise of self-consciousness. Um, mainly an argument that we'll be talking about a little bit later call uh, between the vitalist and the physicalists. And you also believe, truly, I think, in the value of studying ancient Greek philosophy. Let's start the program with that a little bit. I know this is usually an art program, but there is an art to philosophy, and I believe Dr. Pauly is one of the greatest artists I've had the pleasure to meet. And oh, no. <laughs> it's true. Well, Homer was an artist. You know, poetry is an art. Poetry is an art really? writing. I, and that's the foundation of the whole, you know, Homer was thought to be the educator of Greece. Everybody went to Homer to learn. And so Homer is the first writings that we have on shards of vases from the 800 BC Greek land that has been a oral history that was passed down for probably a thousand years, maybe nearly a thousand years before the shards of pottery that we have. Um, back to Troy, the fall of Troy, the many Troys that have been um, there over in Turkey, but <laughs> Anatonia, but a part of the Greek kind of uh, yeah. culture. Tell us about Homer. Well, well, he looks back some generations later at the fall of Troy and writes about, uh, he doesn't write, like, excuse me, he sings about it. So the songs that were uh, developed as a consequence of the fall of Troy, let's say even prior to Homer, were in a way organized by Homer, but he didn't know how to write. He wasn't literate. He didn't know how to read. So it's a pre-literate culture. And, uh, Did anybody know how to read or write? Yeah, they had you know, linear A and linear B. Linear B was deciphered um, by Ventris, you know, about, what, 50 years ago about. So that gave us a line on uh, some, uh, write, some writing, some alphabet that uh, might have even been contemporaneous with Homer. But there was no, uh, it hadn't reached the ordinary class. The writing was used for a specific purpose for keeping temple records. It was accounting. It was lists Basically, of, yeah. I've got 20 right. big vases of oil, I've got 30 bigger vases of oil. So there was no literacy within the general population at all. That, now, that happened later. Linear B uh, is more attributed to the Mycenaean culture, which is a pre-Hellenistic, pre-Greek culture. Well, it's Greek. 
you know, I mean, that's Homeric. The Mycenaean culture was contemporaneous with Homer, or at least with Troy. Those were the Mycenaeans that fought at Troy. They're also called the Achaeans. And they had the same gods and goddesses. Yeah, yeah. it's the... really a civil war. I don't know if it's often looked on as that, but it, the, Troy was a, a civil war among the Mycenaeans and the Trojans. And it's, he's, one of the best phrases I've found about Homer is that he was a diagnostician of disorder. A diagnostician of, of disorder. disorder. I mean, it's a, catches it beautifully because he really wants to expose the fact that Troy fell and that there were powers, destructive powers that had been set loose that nobody could resist. So in a way, it was fated that Troy would fall and also that Achilles would die at Troy. He's one of the other factors in this uh, inevitable destruction that happens. The word ineluctable is wonderful for that. And uh, Achilles is, is singled out uh, to be told that he will die at Troy because he's going to be a symbolic expression of this disorder that uh, is taking place and that nobody can do anything about. And what's the disorder? The fall? The fall, the of, fall the, of powers. The, it's, a, it's the collapse of a civiliza civilization. The Mycenaean. Yeah. And then or the a, Trojan, uh, actually. Yeah, both, both of, of them. them. <laughs> Greek culture, actually, at that stage, uh, collapses. And then there's a couple hundred year, maybe a 500 year lapse before it starts to pick up again. And then you eventually get the classical Greece, which is the high point of the whole culture. And that 500 year period, we don't know why the mass exodus from the palaces, everything was burned, uh, any, any linear B literacy is gone. And then we find, again, these shards of, of vases that start us uh, rediscovering Homer? Yeah, then he gets written down. So then it gets transmitted uh, as literature rather than in an oral form. And it's a huge transition in the culture to move from oral to literate and to rationality. And that's what Plato celebrates. He sees it coming to its epitome in Socrates. And so uh, the argument that there's a quarrel between poetry and philosophy because Plato wants people to uh, come up to the newly achieved uh, technology, which in fact is literacy and rationality. And that's why he's got this brief against Homer. Homer induces a trance state. You, you, you can't think for yourself. You don't even know that you have a self. And that all comes into expression and into focus with Socrates, who is credited with discovering the human soul. No. Yeah, no kidding. It Dr. Paul Lee. Doesn't there, happen anywhere else like it does with Socrates. But we have souls, whether somebody calls it a soul or not. Socrates discovered it. We have it thanks to him. Okay, so this is where you would have quite a bit of con I know. conversation I know. in your story. class. The class but, again. And look at, look at what happened. I mean, Plato's response to Socrates created the greatest body of literature in the history of the human race, namely the Platonic Dialogues. I don't know anything that matches it. So there, there, something happened, something was so explosive, they call it the Greek miracle, I don't mind that term, in terms of what Socrates personified and gave expression to. Now you're talking 400 BC? When? Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Okay, yep. so Dr. Pauly, who's going to be giving a class, everybody sign up for it right now this spring quarter. Cowl 99. Cowl 99, it's called Nobler in the Mind, Introduction to the Humanities with Dr. Pauly, who uh, gave a similar class nearly 50 years ago. Can you believe it? I'll be like Rip Van Winkle. <laughs> There'll be a lot of deja vu going on for him. And uh, I know some people that are still around that took that class of yours 50 years ago. I bet they'll be in on it this time around, too, if I know your friends. It's possible. It's, it's probable. Uh, Dr. Pauly, I see a lot of discussions um, around several points that you just made. First of all, wasn't there rationality before the Greeks wrote it down. No. Didn't pe pe people, are you saying that people weren't as intelligent? No, I'm not. Intelligence is a different matter. And I've had to, in a way, correct my love of the Greeks and my kind of subjection to the Greeks. You know, I went to Harvard. I got the whole shot. So I know how I picked up what you could almost call this ideological set. And I've tried to correct it. I had a great anthropologist friend, Ted Carpenter. And he did a lot of work with the Eskimos. 
And uh, so I've seen many photographs of Eskimos, uh, photographs that are similar with American Indians, where the nobility of the person, the intelligence of the person, is manifest in their face. You can't deny it. But when you think about rationality, namely to think conceptually, and to develop an uh, understanding of logic, uh, that's a uh, discovery of the Greeks that they bequeathed to Western culture in a unique way. And you say that there's nowhere else that you can find this type of, of manifestation. Right. It's unique to Greece. Throughout history. Yep. And we've been under its yoke ever since. Yes. And, and yet, um, <clears throat> there's some other things that I want to ask you about. First of all, um, the idea of the soul. You're saying that Socrates came up with the idea of the soul. Yeah. Up until Socrates, there wasn't what you could call a centered self. People are at the mercy of a play of forces. That's what's so evident in Homer, where the notion of initiating action is usually, a god made me do it. They have recourse to the gods to talk about their own behavior because they don't understand that they have a deciding personal center. They don't, the word for consciousness uh, in, Homer, in Homer is breath, and it's only mentioned when you expel it at death. So in a way it's the last breath, the dying breath. That's consciousness. So it takes from Homer to Socrates to internalize psyche so it becomes uh, the basis for your centered self and the integration of forces where you assume responsibility for them and know how to initiate and uh, conduct your own behavior. So Dr. Paul you, Lee, you, you talk about the integration uh, but there's also a division that's created, and that's the division between the mind and the body. That's true. And that's kind of the dark side. Yes, that is. No <laughs> kidding, and we've been stuck with that ever since. So explain to us how both uh, Socrates was able to create this integration of center of self with the soul, as well as create this division that that we'll talk about some more physicalist, vitalist. Okay, but it's a separation of the knower from the known. That's how you become rational. You have to have some detachment over what you're related to in order to, in a way, objectify it and be able to analyze it and, and describe it and whatnot. And this separation of the knower and, from the known eventuates into the subject-object split. Subject-object sat on a wall, subject-object had a big fall, and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put subject-object together again. So that's the sad outcome of, uh, let's say, an overemphasis on mental relations. And it, it's the case that it's exclusively male. So you have this problem with Western culture, uh, influenced as much as it has been by the Greeks, that the female is left out altogether. I taught a course uh, the last two years I was at Harvard with Paul Tillich, one of the greatest figures in American education. It was called The Self-Interpretation of Man, and it covered the whole history of Western culture in four quarters, and in those four quarters, which was a two-year sweep, not a single woman was mentioned. And do you find that to be an injustice? That's over with. I mean, you couldn't do it again. You couldn't You do couldn't it. offer that course at Harvard now, and you couldn't do it in such a way that it was exclusively male. What was sad about the fact that we were kind of the last uh, effort to do it that way is that a third of the class were Radcliffe students. And it was just prior to women's lib. And nobody raised their hand. You know, they could have blown the cover, but they didn't because they were still under the subjection to the paradigm. And within five years, it was over with. Hallelujah. Yeah, no kidding. Unfortunately, this over with you're talking about is also the beginning of the demise of teaching classics in the university. Down the toilet. Down the toilet. Yeah. Women's lib. Massive like reaction to it. You know, we don't want these dead old white European males. We want we don't want to read Homer, we want to read Black Elk Speaks. So There it goes. So there it goes. So you're throwing out everything, the baby with the bathwater. I'm sneaking it back in. Why? Just to see, you know, if it clicks again. If it clicks again. Because there's such treasures there. I mean to be able to talk about Homeric similes, which is one of my favorite themes, that, that's what I'm doing it for. And to open up a Homeric simile to a student is like watching a flower bloom.
Oh, Dr. Pauli, will you please give us an example of a Homeric simile? Yeah, one of my favorites is when Odysseus returns disguised as a beggar. He's sitting with Penelope, his wife, who doesn't know it's him, and he's singing songs to her about Odysseus. And she starts to cry. And so as she weeps, Homer gives this simile that as the spring winds blow across the frozen mountaintops and turn the snows into spring streams, so melted she. And it, the, the simile starts out, I, I, lo I love the 18th century translation by William Cooper, C-O-W-P-E-R, and it starts out with, with drops of tenderest grief her cheeks bedewed. I mean, come on. <laughs> you can't beat it. Him mourning as remote, who sat beside her. There you go. Yeah, that's one of the tightest lines of any poetry I know. And so her whole fate is in a way exposed in this simile, where she now is going to thaw and melt. And her hardened heart, her, her iron-like resolve to not give in to the suitors while well, Odysseus is gone, now her springtime has come, her husband is next to her, disguised as a beggar, and uh, she is about to flourish and have a new life. Oh, no kidding. Gives and me goosebumps. It's, it's scattered through the Iliad and the Odyssey like that. I mean, the similes, in a way, are the, the great uh, poetic uh, expressions of, uh, of Homer, and, and nothing compares. It, it's, it's unique. Dr. Pauly, again, he will be giving a class, a class that he hasn't given in almost 50 years called, this spring quarter, called Nobler in the Mind, Introduction to the Humanities, Cowl 99, and it will be following the rise of rational consciousness, which Paul, uh, Dr. Paul brings squarely on the division between uh, illiterate, Homeric, Greece and Socrates, and uh, who wasn't literate, but began the rational uh, tradition, the rationale, uh, what do you call them, the dialogues, where through asking questions, the Socratic uh, process was through asking questions and questioning deeply held beliefs. Uh, can open up and reveal pro possibly some unreasonably, unreasonable, unreasonability to your belief. So that which you can't reasonably know is revealed. You can almost say it moves from self-delusion to self-enlightenment. That's what happens when you encounter Socrates. He shows you that what you thought about and, and think you know, you don't. So that's delusional. It's not ignorance. That's the way it's usually translated. It's too bad because it loses the force of delusion. It's that you think you know when you don't. That's delusion. So because Socrates himself makes the confession of self-delusion, it opens him up and makes him transparent. That's why he can be the kind of inquirer that he is. That's why the Delphic Oracle picks him out as the wisest of men because he makes this confession of self-delusion, makes him transparent to the true, the good, and the beautiful. You see through the masks of Socrates like Plato did, and you see the, the, the forms of the, the true, the good, and the beautiful. He, he embodies them. He personifies them. And so he reveals them to you when you come into an encounter with him. So he's like the, the guy who throws the lights on in the cave where you're only looking at the shadows and he shows you what's, what's creating those shadows. He's the guy. And he's like the unnamed prophet at, in the myth of Earth, the end of the Republic, who throws out numbered lots to you and you choose your next life. And so in a way it's an expression of how when you encounter Socrates in the dialogues, your own life is at stake. It's an existential encounter. You're choosing who you are by virtue of your response to Socrates. And the response to his question. That's right. How you answer yeah. this. So you're thinking for yourself. Yeah. Ooh. That's why he's a midwife. He doesn't impart knowledge. And in a way, none of the teaching is, is as important as his being. His being is what is at stake. He is the being of the philosopher. That's why he took on the accoutrements of the wise man for 
ancient Greece after his death and from then on. He's the, the paradigm figure for wisdom. Wow. Yeah. Those are big words, Dr. Good for Pine. him. <laughs> And so you're going to be following, um, you're going to be teaching about Socrates and Plato. Who else will you be mixing in with this rise of consciousness? Well, the pre-Socratics, that's what's so neat about Socrates. They have these, oh, 15 to 20 guys that precede him. And they're called pre-Socratics. And so they, they build up the effort to discover rational self-consciousness. They're, they're after it. And they, they try in this way and that way. They pick out certain things, air, water, fire being, logos, and so on, to try to answer what is it, what's the, what's the basic stuff, uh, what is it. So they prepare the way for Socrates, and a little bit like the prophets prepare the way for Jesus in the, in the Bible, and so they're, I'm going to cover them too. They're, I'll do that rather quickly, they're, they only have, we only have fragments from them. And uh, so they're fairly easy to cover, but they're wonderful to step step through. Who who are these people? Well, Thales is the first, and he said everything is water, and he's the last of the seven wise men, as well as the first of the pre-Socratic philosophers. Then comes Anaximenes, Anaxagoras, uh, uh, Xenophanes, Parmenides, Heraclitus, uh, Anaximander. Uh, Empedocles, you know, I, I love reciting their names as if it's on some kind of a rosary. And what about Euclid? Well, Euclid's off the side because it's mathematics exclusively as really the founder of geometry, but he's definitely included because that's one of the greatest uh, achievements and contributions to Western culture that's, that's ever been made. Euclid. Euclid, boy. Euclid, Euclidean geometry. You got it. I mean, it just pops out like the Platonic Dialogues. You can hardly understand how one guy who is attributed to these theorems and so on establishes geometry forever after. Parmenides. Parmenides is the guy that makes the flight to the vision of being. He's maybe the foremost pre-Socratic philosopher, and uh, he's taken up uh, beyond himself in a chariot, and uh, he's received by a goddess. Uh, at the gates of night and day, and she says, look, and he sees being, when he says, is. Usually it translated is, but it really is, and it cannot not be. It cannot not be. It's the ultimate affirmation of the uh, meaning and vision of being. Meaning, vision of being. <clears throat> you are listening to Artist on Art. We're doing a very special show this uh, March 5th, 2012, I am speaking with Dr. Paul Lee, who has uh, been a uh, pillar in the Santa Cruz community for the last 50 years since you've moved here. Yeah, we got here in 66. Uh, 66. Yeah, second year of the campus. The year I was born. Hmm. Um, no, hey, <laughs> Casey, yes, he's got a pledge drive going on. And... Uh, you're listening to our annual fundraising drive. Every dollar you pledge helps pay our operating costs for another year and gets us closer to reaching our goal. You can use your credit card and pledge online at kzsc.org or call us now at 459-4036. Um, KZSC has been a part of the community radio landscape for over four decades, bringing you engaging, enraging programming you can't hear anywhere else on the dial. Where else would you be able to hear? A fabulous treasure such as our own Dr. Paul Lee. Uh, Dr. Paul Lee is uh, credited with starting the first organic farm on a university, and that's the Chadwick Farm here. Uh, we just passed it. Um, tell us a little bit about that, Dr. Paul. Well, I had a big itch about the campus. They were, you know, I was going to get overburdened by the growth of uh, the campus, so I thought a garden would be a good idea. For students to get involved with. It was the age of flower power. It was 1967. And so I proposed to the Chancellor that we do a student garden project. And he was the son of an old farmer and I thought it was a good idea. So we went to look for a prospective site and then two weeks later Chadwick arrived and agreed to do it. And he went out and bought his own spade and started to dig. And who is Dr. Um, excuse me, Chadwick. Alan Chadwick? Well, he was a British horticulturalist. He had done 
gardens in England and in Long Island, and he was free, he was looking for a venue. And his friend Freya von Moltke was visiting the campus. She introduced me to him. She heard I had wanted to, wanted to do a garden and that she thought Chadwick would do it. And she actually told him to do it. So he was a force of nature. He, he worked 18 hours a day, seven days a week for two or three years before I thought he ought to take a day off. And didn't you take him somewhere? Yeah, I took him to uh, Big Sur. Tassahara. Tassahara. The Zen Center that was just a fabulous place to take him to. It got wonderful waters and bathing and so on. And so it was a great weekend uh, that I spent with him there. And that establishes, established the relationship to Zen Center. Because after he left here, uh, he went to Saratoga, but then from there he went to the Zen Center property at Green Gulch and started the great garden that uh, developed there. Oh, I just say real quickly, KZSC thanks Good Times for supporting this program. Established in 1975, Good Times is published free every Thursday and is distributed at over 650 locations countywide. Good Times features a comprehensive and complete guide to what's happening in Santa Cruz, including the local music scene, dining guide, movie times for the week, and the latest on live theater and the arts. Good Times is also covers important issues confronting the county and the people who make Santa Cruz such a great place to live, work, and play. Good Times is available free every Thursday or find them online at goodtimessantacruz.com. So, uh, Dr. Paul Lee, you're talking about Alan Chadwick, who started the organic garden here up on campus. Um, Alan Chadwick was also a, what do you call him? Um, he believed in bio Dynamic. dynamics. Biodynamics. He was a follower of Rudolf Steiner. And biodynamics uh, is kind of kind of airy fairy. A yes, little. it is. <laughs> but it works. <laughs> tell us, tell us what is biodynamics. The proof is in the pudding. That's right. So uh, he was influenced by Steiner. It was this peculiar, uh, amazing figure. I think he died about 1930. And he was clairvoyant and uh, really a man of many parts. Uh, Started the war, war of school. Your rhythm is a dance for him. He was a philosopher. He was a theologian. And uh, he, he, you know, knew everything. He had an insight into things that was unique. That is what made him clairvoyant. And so there's no gain saying that, but it, you know, he took it off into a big, great big cosmic enterprise that he developed. Anyhow, biodynamics was one of the things he developed because he knew that agriculture and food production was going to go industrial. And he uh, re reacted against that. He thought that's a terrible uh, direction for it to go. So he developed biodynamics to resist the industrial um, style of food production. And he concentrated on compost in order to build up the most fertile soils that you can get, as opposed to applying chemical fertilizers. And so that's what Chadwick introduced here along with the French intensive method that was developed around the environs of Paris to provide the highest quality foodstuffs for the Paris market. So he amalgamated those two uh, systems in a really creative way. Isn't there like crystals involved? No. And planting under a full moon? No, a lot of that. And some Yeah, some you need a staghorn skulls, in order yeah. to put manure in, you bury it and you pick it up. And they do uh, teas, they make special teas to pour on the compost, that's critical to developing the, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what happens with compost? It, it develops uh, gases, you, you know, to break it's up the, the yeah. material, yeah. So Steiner devised these uh, teas made from specific medicinal herbs like stinging nettles and yarrow and so on to facilitate that process and it uh, led to the most uh, fertile and uh, productive comp compost and soil development that you can ask for. There was a, a farm, a uh, live apple farm, yeah, that was in the news. Uh, terrific example here in town. Uh, uh, a um, farm using biodynamics and being very popular. Yeah, and, uh, they're they're just uh, they're amazing. There's also a guy that sells biodynamic soils and so on. On the way into Costco, I forget the name of the street, but it's right near the railroad track. Wow. That's a wonderful place to go to to find the teas. He has those for sale as well, and uh, the biodynamic soils that are as good as you can get for your garden. 
So when you when you were talking with the chancellor about starting this garden, and then things started happening with uh, Alan Chadwick, and you realized that uh, he was doing these things, <laughs> planning under the full moon, things that maybe a uh, science-oriented, research-oriented university might not find uh, uh, very scholarly. Um, it, it's still going. I'm, I'm amazed. We got a letter from a guy protesting about it. He said, what's going on here? Um, you got a cult that's fixed itself on the slope of the university campus, and you got to get them out of there immediately. I mean, we, we teach uh, scientific uh, agriculture at Davis. What does Santa Cruz think they're doing? And he wrote this to the vice chancellor of agricultural sciences, who wrote back and said, um, I think it's probably, I, I agree with you. I think it's probably better to let the students watch things die because they're not using chemical fertilizers and pesticides. So that was his wonderful response to it, and it saved the project. Well, that's that's the paradigm right yeah, there that you, you, you can't grow food without using insecticides and pesticides. And then more and more and more and more and more because you got to keep doing because your soils become so uh, they lose so much fertility that you've really changed it over into synthetic fertilizers. So one time a guy said to the chancellor, why are you letting this happen here? Why do you have this guy you're planting by the moon? And McHenry, whose father was a farmer, said, well, my father planted by the moon. <laughs> that was the end of that. <laughs> Don't be dissing my dad. That's right. <laughs> Dr. Polly. So you started the organic garden here on campus. Um, you took a hiatus from the, from, from the university. I was kicked out. You were kicked out. Um, do we want to get into that? Yeah, I okay. mean, it, was, it had something to do with the organic garden. I was teaching at Crown, and the scientists didn't like the notion that organic meant something new. They thought chemicals were chemicals, and what's the fuss? So uh, I pretty much um, got uh, knocked for that. But I also didn't publish, so I deserved it. I mean, I thought the garden would count as a bad book, but it didn't. Ah. And then you went into uh, herbalism? No, well, then I went into community development with Paige Smith. He, oh, right. he, he was the provost of Kyle College, the founder of the university with McHenry. So he decided to resign in protest, and he said, any place that doesn't have room for Paul Lee doesn't have room for me, which even today has a nice ring. And so we went out together and started the William James Association in order to reestablish the Civilian Conservation Corps. So volunteerism? Yeah. That he had been socialist. In the, you know, Roosevelt, it was one of the great programs of Roosevelt, and Page had been in it, the CCC, in 1940. So he saw a necessity for doing it over again. Well, we failed at the federal level, but we did get the California Conservation Corps started at the instigation of Jerry Brown, who turned it over to us when he wanted to see a state corps. Well, now, that was the first time Jerry Brown was the governor. Yeah, first time. Back at yeah, 1976. And so you helped start the California Conservation Corps. Right, that was wonderful because it, it fulfilled our aim and we had no idea that it would happen like that. And then when did the goose, when did Florence start talking to you? Well, about 1985, then the homeless issue started to emerge. There was a woman in town who was fasting to the death, uh, lest somebody open a public shelter. And uh, so Paige and I decided to bite the bullet and open the shelter to get her off. She was in the, about the 27th day of her fast. She was in the hospital, and she was near death. So we got a shelter open and saved her, and then we were kind of stuck with it ever since. Ah, stuck with it. So you I kept thinking, why didn't she open a shelter instead of starving herself to death? So I had to. She was opening up so the wait, space wait. for your That's right. for you to move. Yeah. So you started the homeless shelter that's still going on today, yeah, uh -huh. and and an, a, another offshoot from the homeless shelter is the homeless garden. Right, and that's going on. That's twenty years old now, 20. and that's a wonderful project. And you also uh, have started several different projects, but I want to just make sure everybody understands that if you want to see a lot, a lot, a lot of information that Dr. Polly has been involved with, you can go to ecotopia.org, and everything is there. A lot, a lot, a lot. And you um, talk about opening up a, or creating a green belt. Well, we did that. Well, that was the Green Belt Initiative in 1979, I think, and I initiated that. And so that saved Poganip, which was my main consideration, although the Green Belt is much larger than Poganip. 
although Polignac already is about 625 acres, so it's a considerable piece. And uh, the Homeless Garden is the only sanctioned project for moving on to the Greenbelt, so we're hoping that that'll ha happen sooner or later. <laughs> Sooner or later. Yeah. You know, we're making some things happen with that, some projects. So you were involved with the homeless shelter, the homeless garden, um, and you're still writing? Yeah. And what's your main focus right now? I got a, uh, the, I just finished the Chadwick book. I mean, that took me forever. I, I was been working on that for like four, 135 years. <laughs> and that's the garden in the mind. Yeah, there's the garden in the mind. I took the title from a meditation on the garden that Norman O. Brown uh, worked out. He called it My Georgics. Wonderful thing. It was inimitably knobby, as we called Norman O. Brown. He was one of the most popular figures here on the campus in those days. And so I just finished it. It's been picked up by North Atlantic Press. It'll come out next March. So. That's done. And so I have a number of other things to finish. I've uh, kind of pulled together my theological reflection as a letter of Paul to the Athenians, a letter he never wrote but wished he had, so I, I've done it for him. And that's been fun to do. So I'm going to finish that off and get that out. So what is this letter that Paul never got to write that, that you think uh, really needs to be well, Paul went to Athens. It was one of his visits. He never wrote a letter back, which he, he could have, because he converted a figure there named Dionysius the Areopagite, not to be confused with Dionysius the God. It just happened to be this guy's first name. And uh, he was a figure of uh, some importance on the Areopagus, uh, a minor official, but he was converted listening to Paul and became the first bishop of Athens. And then late in life, he went to France and became the patron saint of France, Saint Denis, D-E-N-I-S, which is French for Dionysius. And then a third figure comes into the tradition a couple hundred years later, writing under the name of Dionysius the Areopagite, uh, great mystical treatises. He's usually referred to as pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite. And so I've been very much influenced by him, especially the second guy who had his head cut off in Paris. So I like to th think of him as the exemplar of setting reason aside. And instead of wearing my heart on my sleeve, I carry my head in my hands. So I, and the, the third guy, the pseudo dynasty wrote what's called negative theology. It's kind of like the Zen logic of negation. So I've picked that up. I, I, I like to think of faith without content. So you sweep the decks, you know, clear your mind. Not this, not this, not this. So I've, I've been influenced by this uh, theology of negation. And it's, that's partly the theme of Paul's letter to the Athenians. And I, a couple of years ago, I went to Paris, kind of in the footsteps of Saint-Denis, the great cathedral outside of Paris, the Royal Abbey of Saint-Denis, is where many of the kings and queens of France are buried. It's a fantastic cathedral, the first Gothic cathedral in Europe. And so everywhere I went, I looked for evidence of Saint-Denis, and I found a sculpting from the 16th century, and I bought it. So here he is standing with his head in his hands, and that stands out in front of my house. So he's had a wonderful influence on me, and uh, I've written this treatise, so to speak, uh, in, in his honor. So, Dr. Pauli, you... You are both attracted to ancient Greece and the rise of rational consciousness and uh, in a way have kind of had to bring forth uh, with you this division of the mind and the body, objectivism, uh, uh, objective and subjectivism. Um, you also are trying to repair that schism, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And part of that has been your uh, understanding of the difference between vitalism and physicalism. Well, actually, it goes back to Plato as well. You have a, a, a bridge uh, between mind and body in Plato's construction of uh, consciousness. And it's the term tumos, T-H-Y-M-O-S. That's my favorite word. I've, um, I've spent 50 years thinking about tumos. And it's translated as courage, vitality, and spiritedness. It's spirit, but in the biological sense of spirit. You know, it's a spirited woman, like Nada, like you. You, you evince that kind of spiritedness that Tumas uh, connotes. 
So that's the link to the mind-body. And I, I found that uh, tumos is related to the thymus gland. The thymus is a derivative of the Greek word tumos, as is the herb thyme, thymus vulgaris. So I spent a lot of time reading and thinking about the thymus gland as the link between the mind and the body, and now that actually is the case. And the guy that uh, has proposed this link recently died, and there was an obituary about him in the New York Times, it, it, stating that the, the thymus is the link between the mind and the body. So, you know, he created the field called psychoneuroimmunology. And so I'm thrilled that uh, there's now this uh, scientific field that uh, explores this express link. Even though science on its path since Galileo has done everything it can to uh, eliminate uh, vitalism from the conversation, rational, scientific inquiry does not allow for life. In fact, you said something about how you shouldn't call something life sciences, maybe we should call it death sciences. I was quoting St. George, who is a famous scientist, and <clears throat> that's what he says, uh, that life is not the uh, possible object of scientific inquiry. I mean, I was stunned to see that they've gone that far and realizing that they, they, they can't get at it. And so uh, it's a consequence of the trend since Galileo to reduce everything to matter. Matter is all that matters. And the progression within science from Galileo to now through Descartes and Newton and so on is perfectly obvious as far as the reduction to matter. And you might as well say chemicals as well. Uh, chemical forces and uh, material forces are all there is as far as physical science is concerned. They actually had a, a group in Germany in the early part of the 19th century called the Physicalist Society and they had a blood oath they took in order to confirm the reduction of everything to uh, nothing but uh, material forces. So it's, it's, I don't know how long it's going to take for us to overcome that and in a way it's too late. How, how is it too late? Well, because that theme, which is industrial society, that, that's kind of the basis, the basic theme for industrial society, as a world above the given world of nature, predicated on matter, as all that matters. Um, it's taken us to the point now there would be no return given the environmental crisis, and no matter what we do, it's too late. Global warming. I'm sorry. You know, that, I'm, I hate to be that pessimistic about it. The worst thought I ever had was that the environmental movement is the death rattle of defeated vitalism. Mm -hmm. Vitalism was refuted in 1828 with the artificial synthesis of urea. And so we've had this neo-vitalist upsurge since 1970 and Earth Day and so on, and everybody has rallied, or those who have have rallied to try to save the environment and they understand what's happening and give expression to it. And to think of that as the death rattle of uh, defeated vitalism was a difficult thing to entertain. Dr. Pauly, you will be giving a class this spring, coming up, uh, a new class, in the Cowl, Cowl 99, Nobler in the Mind, Introduction to the Humanities, following the rise of rational consciousness, starting with the pre-Socratics, or Homer, are you going to start with yeah, Homer? Yeah, starting with Homer. Starting with Homer, going through the pre-Socratics, uh, some amazing philosophers, and then Socrates and Plato. Where does Socrates begin? Where does Plato end? Or how, how does that go? <laughs> you can't divide it. You can't divide no, it. They're, they're one. Because Plato wrote... It's an embrace. It's an embrace. Yeah. And they, uh, And that's what you'll be discussing a class that you gave nearly 50 years ago in... I also taught it in the history of consciousness. I did it as a core course at Cowell, and then I got into the history of consciousness and taught it there. And um, this, is, this is all uh, in the um, attempt for people to learn how to think for themselves? Yeah, it's, that's the first enlightenment. And is that really what the university wants? Beats me. <laughs> It's hard to say now because it's not a university anymore. I got the message from uh, two chancellors back when she uh, consistently referred to it as a major research institution and she didn't use the word university. So that's the extent to which science has taken over here.
the major research institution. institution. Yeah. So I mean, come on, they gave it up. The game's up. The game. So I'm going to stick it in just for the hell of it. <laughs> see, you see what happens, <laughs> Doctor Pauli. Um, when I was studying philosophy as an undergraduate, my family in, in Europe were always wondering, well, the Americans don't want you to think. Why, why are you learning how to think for yourself? <laughs> um, but isn't that why we go to college? You think so? <laughs> yeah, really? Come on. I told you, I did, I did a talk in uh, Faye Crosby's class uh, as a kind of, uh, she said, you ought to get a sense of what students are like, come up and speak to my class two times. So I did. And I poured my heart out about teaching this upcoming class and so on. I was trying to attract students. And she made it sound like they weren't going to understand anything I said and so on. So at the end of the class, this guy comes up to me and he says, I'm not interested in anything you've had to say. I'm only interested in getting a job and making lots of money. I'm still stunned that the, the, that, that happened to me. I mean, well, why was he so nasty to do that? Well, that's what he thought. That's what he wanted to express. Yeah, yeah, it's an, it's a, it's an it's interesting a tough question. Line, man. I mean, what do you do to make a dent in that guy's brain? Well, I, th I think it's interesting that um, another kind of hang-up for a lot of people was the idea that um, rationality began with the ancient Greeks. It's very difficult to understand that there was not conceptual thinking. Because we think conceptually. That's exactly. We yeah. are so immersed. We read in it the... back everywhere and think, well, isn't everybody kind of been like that? No. That's why it's such an eye opener to take students back to Homer where there is no conceptual thought. It's all imagery. It's all poetry. It's, there's, no, there's no understanding. You couldn't ask a Homeric hero what justice is. He doesn't know what you're talking about. There's also action. Yeah, it's all action. It's, it's all, all action. Dramatic narrative. Dramatic narrative. Yep. And also considered one of the first pieces of, of literature? Yeah. It's the foundation piece. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's, and, and that's what's so stunning is that uh, Plato won't admit Homer into the into the Greek life. They, they want to expel Homer. Why? Because it's a mentality that is basically hypnotized. Because the the tendency is to go into a trance state when you hear the Homeric poems recited. And that trance state is exactly what Plato wants people to awaken from and why Socrates is the guy to do it. One of his epithets is, is a stingray or a gadfly. He, he, he stings you. And uh, the whole purpose is to wake you up from this uh, Homeric trance state. You hope. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck. You have uh, also written about the state of students and having to leave your soul, or have... <laughs> yeah, really. Well, Paige Smith, the la one of the last books he wrote was called "Killing the Spirit." Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, very serious title, and it was re his reflection on higher education. I think because it's gone so scientific, and uh, at the expense of uh, your soul, and um, so I got the idea that we'd put up a spiritual cloakroom at the entrance of the campus in the fall and incoming freshmen could check their spirit in and then we'd keep it for four years and uh, if we could find it when they wanted it back, we'd uh, return it. If you could find it. Yeah, really. If they still had the little number. You want to do that now? <laughs> I do. I think it would be a great performance piece. <laughs> really? <laughs> Dr. Polly, you have some other performance pieces uh, you're thinking about too. One of those about the Hawthorne. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, that's, that's a little off the wall still, I think. <laughs> The, the one I'd love to do is the myth of Ur, the end of Plato's Republic. I always wanted to do that. And uh, it's a reincarnation myth. It's really uh, almost the heart of the Platonic philosophy. And uh, it would uh, lend itself perfectly to a performance piece. I wanted to do it on New Year's Eve 1999, you know, going into 2000. But I couldn't get it together. And I, I actually tried to do it at Harvard before I left in the Le Corbusier building, which has these ramps that would have made it perfectly suitable. And I even had Eric Erickson agreeing to be the unnamed prophet who throws out the lots for you to choose your new identity. I mean, it would have been one of the great uh, experiences of my life, but I didn't bring that off either. Hey, we can still do it, Dr. We can. Dr. We can. Polly. We will do it. We'll just uh, evoke Eric Erickson oh, and, and all your other friends from back then. He was made to order. He was made to He was so beautiful. Aww. Dr. Pauli, 
He has been talking to us here on Artist on Art on this very special March 5th, 2012, hour-long interview. Um, we've been discussing a little bit about his, um, in a way, an evolution of, of thoughts that, that you've kind of gone through. And uh, he's going to be teaching a class this spring quarter entitled Nobler in the Mind. It's an introduction to the humanities. It's Cowell 99 and it discusses the rise of rational consciousness. And if you, uh, if you want to read more about Dr. Paul Lee and his ideas, please go to ecotopia.org. We only have a few more minutes, Dr. Paul Lee. Would you mind telling us how you came up with the idea of ecotopia? Well, it was a novel that uh, Kallenbach wrote that had a big play. It's actually not a very good novel. But the, the concept was wonderful. It's about a, a region north of here that secedes from the United States in order to turn itself into a kind of environmental test case. And I thought, that's perfect for Santa Cruz. We would uh, secede from the United States, and we'd seal off 17 coming over in Highway 1 north and south, and we'd put up kiosks where you'd get a passport, and you would enter Ecotopia, and it would be a destination for ecotourists. And so based on that, I've, I de developed a circle trail, which encompasses the west side of Santa Cruz and hits all the main spots. You go up from, let's say, the university over to Poganip and down the river to the ocean and then around Westcliff Drive and up again. It's a, it's a really wonderful notion as a, about a 17-mile circle. And then added to that, we uh, developed the Ecology Hall of Fame because uh, I wanted to put Chadwick in it. And so we've got that up on the website, and I'd love to finally make that actually an established institution where people could go and uh, see the history of the environmental movement in kind of panorama form, photographs and, and uh, telling quotes and so on, and you'd walk through it in an hour, hour and a half, you'd understand the history of American environmentalism. So that might happen at some point. Excellent. You've been listening to Artist on Art. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Thank Pauline. you, Nada. Please Wonderful stay tuned for Unfiltered Camels. You've been listening to Artist on Art. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for listening.